Hi, everyone. We'll wait a couple of minutes um, to let everybody arrive and um, check the sound settings. Vanella, should we um, just put the, the starting slide on? Um, on my presentation. Works. Hi, everyone. We'll start in a minute or two, probably a minute. Thanks for joining. The faces you can see on your screen are our panel for today, and <laughs> I'll introduce them in a second. Um, thank you, Fenella. Thank you. Okay. So... Let's get started. As you will have seen, we have um, a big panel for today, so we don't want to lose any time. <laughs> so I'll just make a start straight away. Um, my name is Stephanie. I'll be chairing this session today, and um, I'll speak a little bit in the beginning uh, about um, Edeka and about the uh, organization of our seminar today. Um, and I'll introduce the speakers to you and then I'll hand over to them. And this is supposed to be an interactive uh, session. So you're not supposed to sit here and just receive information for one and a half hours. We would really welcome your input and your questions and your comments. But um, I'll say a little bit more about how you can do that uh, in just a second. If you could go to the next slide, Vanilla. <clears throat> so again, very welcome to our session today. Uh, it's nice to see so many of you here. We'll see see the number. Um, so our plan is that I give a very quick introduction, and then we'll hear short talks by um, Ken Emond and Lisa Williams, and then we'll have a Q&A, and then we'll hear some more talks uh, by Gerard Maguire, Matthew Tata, and Tom Stafford. I'll say a little bit about who these people are and what they'll be talking about in a second, and even though you can see here that there's a Q&A uh, slotted in in the middle, this doesn't mean that you cannot um, post any questions in between. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So um, about the questions that you can ask, you can see a Q&A tab at the bottom and you can see a chat. We would really prefer if you could put the questions that you have for these speakers into the Q&A. It's easier for us to see them there. And you can also upvote questions that you would like to, to ask, but somebody else was quicker to type. The chat can be used um, to talk and discuss as you go along. And if you prefer, you can also raise your hand and ask a question in person. So our speakers for today um, are Dr. Ken Eamon from the British Academy, who will be talking about um, first uh, results uh, from trials on the modified lottery or randomization processes and uh, applications. Then we have Dr. Lisa Williams, who's joining us from Australia. And she is the chief investigator for Women in STEM Ambassador Grant, where they tested the data on, or where they tested um, an uh, anonymization of applications, practice that word in advance, they're always going wrong. And then, like I said, we'll have a short uh, break. These will be the first two speakers where we are break, where we'll have a bit of a Q&A. And then we'll continue um, with uh, 
Yoroi Maguire from the Wellcome Trust. He's part of the EDI team there. And he'll talk a bit about, um, about a project um, on training development for committee members and assessors. We have Dr. Matthew Tata with us uh, from Cancer Research UK, who will talk about a study that comes out today that they have conducted on the effectiveness of narrative CVs. And uh, we've got Professor Tom Stafford, who will be talking about um, AFIRE, the Accelerator for Innovation and Research Funding Experimentation, which has also launched this month. And I'm at the bottom of the list, but I'll be talking first. And next slide, please, Vanilla. So this is our code of conduct. Um, Vanilla will also share a link to it in the chat. Um, we will monitor the chat and um, the Q&A. And if you do not adhere to this code, um, where we try to create a harassment-free experience, where we are respectful with each other and the way we ask questions and respond, we will have to boot you. Okay, so to warm up, we have thought of um, two audience poll questions. So to avoid it, you go and make yourself a tea before everything gets started. We would like you to uh, vote on two questions. Um, they should come up on your screen, Vanilla. Does it? I think you are the one posting them. Yes. So, um, oh, apparently host and panelists cannot vote. But uh, for our attendees, um, the first question that we posted is, how much do you trust the peer review process for funding applications? Totally, mostly, somewhat, not at all. So for this first question, um, you might want to wear your applicant hat when you have applied for funding in the past. And our second question, for that one, you would have to wear your reviewer hat. Mm. There are a way of sharing the responses for now, because I can't see. Looks like we have to stop the presentation for that. <laughs> Can you see the results now? No. You might have to read them out. Ah, there we go. Okay. Okay, so... Um, for our first question, how much do you trust the peer review uh, process? Uh, mostly and somewhat. And uh, I guess that sets up sets the tone quite nicely uh, for um, the need or for the interest and in interventions on how to make this process fairer, which we'll hear a bit about today. And which of these characteristics make it harder for you um, to be unbiased? Um, also, a very interesting one that probably varies across and is very hard to answer because we are probably not always quite aware. But yeah, personal connection, expertise on the topic submitted. So again, it might be quite interesting to hear um, when we, uh, more about um, the process of anonymizing applications and what effect this can have. Okay, thank you very much for your responses. And um, you have to click twice to get to the next. Yep. Okay. So that's all on housekeeping. Um, I'll give you a short uh, overview now of um, our EDICA report on uh, peer review bias in the funding process. Um, if you attended um, the first seminar, you will have heard a short summary there as well. If you haven't, or if you have, here's a reminder, or here's a bit of an overview of it. Um, the purpose of the study that we conducted, and Vanella will um, share a link in the chat if you are interested in reading it in more detail, 
is that we wanted to examine the evidence that exists for biases and interventions across various stages of the funding process. And the scope of the review included both um, policy documents from funders, where we got a bit of an idea of what interventions are in place already, um, and what changes are being made, and uh, what needs are being responded to, as well as the peer-reviewed literature that collected evidence both on biases and the effectiveness of these interventions. And we collected data from the last 10 years. And um, the impact of the study is that we wanted to describe how various biases affect the submission rates and funding success, which is very crucial for the career progression of academics in every sector. And um, the next slide, please, Vanilla. So if you have read the report, you will have seen this, or, or if you have looked at the summary on the website, so um, initially we were interested in the review stage, which is the fourth stage here, but by only focusing on the peer review uh, process alone, we couldn't really get a full picture because uh, we could not really see why only certain applications arrived at the peer review stage. So we've widened it and looked at the funding call, uh, the process of preparing applications from the applicant's uh, perspective, preparing the review proce process from the funder's perspective, the review stage, which usually includes um, the um, review panels and the funding outcome. You can see examples here for questions that we posed um, and that we tried to answer. And our finding is that bias affects all of these stages. And next slide, please. So the evidence that we found varies. Um, you can see um, a short summary of uh, our findings for four of these stages. So the review stage summarizes here um, the previous stage four and five, so uh, uh, sorry, three and four, which was preparing the review process and um, the review stage. So in the funding call, we found that the wording, or no, we didn't find, we, we found literature that shows evidence for how the wording, varying degrees of support and tight deadlines dissuade applicants um, from marginalized groups um, to even put an application together. Um, there are lower submission rates and grant sizes amongst women, early career researchers, disabled researchers, and racially, uh, racially minoritized researchers and researchers from less prestigious institutions. And um, we found that in the review stage, there is bias or there's training for unconscious bias um, in several funding bodies, but there's also um, evidence also shows that that's not um, necessarily effective, but that there's also other issues like ambiguous scoring criteria, um, that lead to lower scores for minority researchers. And uh, as a result of all of this, there's significantly lower funding rates uh, for the earlier outlined groups. So next slide, please. Um, as mentioned, there is a lot, uh, there is the evidence that we found isn't, is really concentrated um, on the review stage. So we know surprisingly little about the first two, two stages of the research process. So what are the, what's going on internally? What, dis, what really dissuades people from um, applying? Um, we, do, we did find quite um, a bit of research and evidence on experiences of women and how biases affect women, but we found very little on disabled researchers or, and on, um, uh, on ethnic minorities and the effects of race, surprisingly. We also couldn't really find uh, much evidence for uh, the evaluation of interventions and how effective they are. Um, and training for reviewers is always seen as um, a great solution uh, to all of our EDI problems, but what this training looks like, we couldn't really find out either. Um, so, this is why we are very excited about today's seminar. Um, if you could go to my last slide, please, Vanilla. So today we'll hear uh, about studies that have been conducted very recently that show us our first results um, on attempts to evaluate interventions that have been 
phrased in the literature as hypothetically solutions to problems or very promising um, approaches that could offer solutions, like uh, what's often called a modified lottery or randomization, um, or what could happen if we anonymized applications as well as narrative CVs. So we've got um, speakers today who will, who will talk about uh, trials about these interventions. Um, we will hear about um, a project that tries to develop EDI training for assessors. Um, and we'll hear about guidelines for testing interventions, which could, would be especially relevant for um, funders. Okay, so um, that's uh, all from my presentation. Thank you very much, Fenella, for sharing the slides. And if you have any questions um, about anything that I just said, I'm very happy to also answer questions uh, in the Q&A that follows Ken and Lisa's pre um, presentations. And I just saw, I forgot to mention, yes, this is recorded and the recording will be made available. Got to say that, I'm very sorry. So I would like to hand over to Ken. It's great to have you here, Ken. Um, and your presentation will be shared now. Thanks, Vanilla. That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Stephanie. And uh, it's uh, great to be able to talk a little bit about the British Academy's experiment with partial randomization. Um, if you can go on to the next slide. Uh, we've been experimenting with this uh, approach with our British Academy Leverhulme Small Research Grants Programme. Uh, this is a scheme that attracts a lot of interest. We get many applications each year, most of which are fully suitable for funding. Um, these are very small scale, uh, often uh, experimental grants are commonly used as pilot studies for small scale projects up to £10,000. The kind of uh, grant where you can really take more of a risk because you're investing a small sum of money to enable um, interesting and uh, uh, exciting approaches to be tested out. Uh, and many of the people who are successful with these grants do go on subsequently uh, to win much larger scale funding from other people. Um, it also helps many early career researchers to get the first chance to be a principal investigator on a, have their name as a lead on a grant. Um, the, the characteristic of the scheme, this was a scheme where we received very many high quality applications, far more than we can afford to fund. Um, it required a lot of assessment, as you can imagine, you'll see the numbers in a, a short while. Um, and uh, they were relatively fine distinctions, you know, the time spent at the final stages of the process, deciding really very, very fine distinctions between who could be funded and who couldn't, uh, we established really was probably not uh, the right approach to spend so much time and effort on. Um, the decision to use partial randomization um, came about really through uh, our original um, EDI working group. So it was very much intended as a way of increasing diversity. And that was in terms of geographical diversity, institutional diversity, as well as personal characteristics. It, we identify, if you go on to the next slide, as partial randomization, um, simply because we initially continue to um, uh, have the normal peer review process to begin with. Uh, so all applications that are submitted to each round of the competition are assessed in the normal way in the, to begin with to decide whether or not the applicant passes the quality threshold. And there are the set criteria for the scheme, that is the uh, particularly the quality of the research, the methodology that's being proposed, uh, the feasibility of its time scale, and so on. Uh, and it, the uh, approach that we found, uh, about 60% of the applications that are submitted to us pass that quality threshold, and they are all then entered into the randomized allocation. There is no pre-selection of the top candidates to be funded. Um, what we found with this, it allows us to be able to give more feedback to applicants uh, about the reasons for their application if they're unsuccessful, either that they were a particular characteristic that was felt not to be as strong compared to others, or alternatively, that they passed the quality threshold but were simply not selected on the randomized basis. 
The initial findings, we've we run two rounds of competition a year. We've run three rounds completed so far. So we're about halfway through the trial that we have set out to start with. We're doing it on six rounds or three years of competition. Um, we've seen a significant increase in the number of applications overall being submitted. We've seen a significant increase in the pool of applicants, particularly from Black, Asian and other ethnic backgrounds. We've maintained uh, both in terms of application submission and in terms of awards, and that's raised something from 18 to about 25 percent of the pool as a whole. Um, we've maintained the gender diversity that we already had. It's roughly 50-50 um, in each round of competition in terms of gender diversity. We've also seen a significant uh, spectrum of institutions represented, something like 100 different institutions um, are uh, represented among the each round of competition uh, in the total we've given. Um, the overall success rate, if you go on to the final slide, is about 27%. Um, we have, in fact, seen a further increase in the number of applications that were submitted uh, from 22-23 to 23-24. It's now over 1,800 applications. That's over 900 per round. Uh, but in the most recent round, the third that was decided on the basis of the partial randomization, we've actually been able to increase with the, the funding we've been able to obtain from the government, from Leverhulme and from our other partners, uh, we were able to make 500 awards um, over the past year, 23, 24. So it's maintained a success, although the total number of applicants has gone up, but the success rate has also gone up. We are continuing to monitor um, all of the characteristics. The, the trial will continue for uh, a further three rounds, at least we're evaluating as we go along. Um, but the uh, overall impression we've got is that it is has been very, very successful, as I say, in raising the interest um, among a, a wide range of people who perhaps self-disqualified themselves in the past, thinking there's no point in applying to the British Academy because I have, whether it's an institutional background or a personal characteristic or whatever, I'm not going to get funded because it, all the awards will be given to people of a different characteristic. Um, hopefully, we're very successfully overcoming that. So that's our brief introduction to our um, work on partial randomization and I'm very happy to answer questions at a later stage after we've heard, I think, from Lisa next. Thank you, Ken. Okay. Um, I think Fernanda's going to put Lisa's. While I do that, do you just want to ask, answer a quick question from Jack Leahy? What is the percent of fundable applications per round? Sorry, I switched my mute. It's about 60% that pass the quality threshold. So we are able to fund something like half the applications that are put forward. Um, it, it, it slightly varies from round to round, but it's on average about that. Um, and that's something that we're very proud because they're small scale grants, we're able to, um, to, to give lots of them. Thank you. Um, there's another question that came in, but we'll we'll say we'll answer this um, after after Lisa's presentation. So thanks again, and uh, Lisa. Thank you. Yours. Just getting a timer going. Um, mm -hmm. It's really delightful to be with y'all today. It's it's a little bit late here. <laughs> I'm joining you from Australia. Um, I'm not obviously perhaps due from my accent from Australia. Um, but I'm here today to share with you some of the research that we've been doing on the Women in STEM Ambassador Team. Um, next slide, please. Um, before I get into it, the full credit is due to the entire research team, including our fantastic project lead, uh, Isabel Kingsley. Um, we had a number of research assistants, as well as professor, another Lisa, uh, Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith, who is the Australian government's Women in STEM ambassador. So by way of introduction, that's a government initiative that's been in place since 2018 to increase the participation of girls and women in STEM disciplines and careers. Um, as part of that initiative, um, which is funded by government grants, which is, um, I'm the chief investigator on those grants, we've been conducting a series of um, research studies to try and shed light on where inequities 
might exist and what mechanisms might be put in place to redress them. So this is one part of our research portfolio. Um, so to set the scene, next slide. Um, the value of an animate, oh, I've forgotten I have animations here. You can go ahead and make the two images appear, sorry. Um, the value of anonymization is pretty clear. Most of us are aware of kind of the famous study where existing longstanding gender biases in orchestra auditions were suddenly vanished when um, the auditioners were blinded or the um, evaluators were blinded. And um, of course, to this audience, it's no surprise that anonymization stands as kind of one of the hallmarks of the peer review process, um, often for publication or for um, funding applications um, or research applications, which is what we're talking about today. Um, next slide, and probably a couple clicks. So um, the value of anonymous anonymization, whether that's single or blind anonymous peer review has been tested as one mechanism to get rid of documented barriers um, to equity in STEM. So this has been looked at in terms of researcher gender, researcher ethnicity, um, has been documented in the area of scientific publications, as well as quite famously, um, reducing or actually eliminating gender biases in access to Hubble Space Telescope time. So in the context of this, it seems like perhaps anonymization um, could be kind of the magic trick, like let's sort out how to do that for funding or uh, resource applications. Could, could this be the winner. Um, we came into this research understanding that most of the research had been done in the US, um, so being in Australia, which is a slightly different research ecosystem. Um, like the UK, it's relatively smaller. Folks are a little bit more well known. Um, and we had the opportunity to ask for research organizations to join us. Uh, next slide, please to join us to um, trial anonymizing applications for access to scientific equipment. So these four organizations run um, schemes to grant researchers from, from their own organizations and from external to their organizations for access to telescope time, um, computing time, and the like. Um, the four organizations signed up to share their data with us from prior to anonymization and post anonymization. Can I get two clicks, please? Um, so three of the organizations to anonymize them um, required applicants to exclude their names and affiliations in the application text to use third person language and to provide more identifying information in a separate document, which was available to evaluators, um, but the evaluators um, weren't compelled to look at that. One organization decided to apply with what we're calling semi-anonymization. Um, they allowed the applicants to use first initials and surnames, um, removing affiliations and shifting that list to the end of the application. So kind of deprioritizing what might be a default where applicants applicant information appears first. So we have some variability already. You can see in the study design um, setting this up. Next slide, please. So we got access, a couple more clicks, sorry. <laughs> One more. Um, we had access to pre and post data on application scores, success rates, and how the resources were allocated. And we wanted to see if there were existing inequities prior to anonymization and then what the effect of anonymization was. So I'm going to go through our three outcomes one at a time. Um, the first is uh, career seniority. So what we found is that in, in the two organizations that provided career seniority data, there were no differences in the three outcomes. So scores, um, scores, uh, sorry, scores, success rates, or resource allocation. One more click, please. But what we did find, importantly, is that anonymization significantly boosted success rates for early career researchers at one of those two organizations. And you can see here, the effect is pretty striking. So the equity beforehand um, could have perhaps been shading some biases against 
early career researchers. And once that career stage information was not available to evaluators, we see um, a sudden increase in the success rates amongst those applicants. In terms of gender, what we found were, again, no significant differences um, according to gender. Uh, in the three outcomes prior to anonymization. You can flash up the figure for that. So of course, success rates and scores, scoring patterns differed across the four organizations, but you can eyeball here, and we did all the modeling to test whether these are different across um, gender and found no evidence for that. In terms of, um, one, next slide, please. So that was before anonymization. Now, after anonymization, what we found is that the existing gender equity in scores and resources was maintained. So that's a good sign. Um, we didn't introduce sy systematic biases in terms of gender uh, for these two outcomes. And for the third outcome, next slide, um, anonymization elevated success rates at one of the four organizations. So I wouldn't... I wouldn't put all my um, eggs in that one basket, but there is some evidence of shifting um, shifting outcomes for um, genders according to anonymization. But again, this was um, in, in one of the four organizations. Um, so I will offer some conclusions and implications quickly. I'm, I'm out of time. So first, um, I guess what, what these findings point to is that anonymization can serve as a mechanism to improve peer review. Um, so especially looking at that early career data, what looked like equity at the beginning, kind of um, un anonymization uncovered that that might actually be a pattern of inequity that anonymization can resolve. Um, that this process can have value, especially when implemented with care when and where needed. And that's perhaps the the biggest punchline here, which is um, perhaps to go in with anonymization where there is evidence of inequity that could be solved. Um, so I don't think personally that anonymization is a panacea, but it can certainly help in situations where there are documented inequities. One more slide, please. Um, so what we also want to emphasize here, and this is echoing um, some of what Stephanie was saying, is that evaluation is really essential. So we're obviously sharing the findings of this research. We need to know more about when and where anonymization works um, to help shift the dial towards equity in the um, in in research, kind of in the research ecosystem, and that we need to, you know, as the Women in STEM ambassador. Our data were limited to men and women. We need to know a lot more about the full spectrum of gender as well as other aspects of identity. Um, as Ken mentioned, things like ethnicity are equally as important. Um, so I'll just flip out this last slide. Um, we have a preprint, um, which is under peer review at the moment, and also a research brief um, that you can check out these results in more detail. And of course, reach out via all the places. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, that was very insightful. And I have to say, I've, I've had a look at the report beforehand, but um, it was it was much more accessible the way you presented the information just out of, uh, in these seven minutes than me trying to read it in like in the same amount of time. So that was very helpful. Thank you very much. It's a dense uh, approach. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, we've got a few questions and naturally because uh, people had a bit more time to think about it, there's a few more questions for Ken, but there's also some for you, Lisa. So um, I'll start uh, with those that have, uh, uh, trying to be uh, democratic about it, that have received most votes um, as there seems to be most interest. So there's quite a few that have received three votes. So I'll just start um, for, um, with two for you, uh, Ken, and then I'll have one for Lisa. So the first one we have for you is uh, by Rachel. Thank you, Ken, for your presentation. Is there any bias in the 60% who meet the thresholds to enter the lottery if there's no anonymization at that point? Well, what we've been doing is looking at the characteristics of the people who do, uh, you know, pass the threshold and reach the uh, be, be successful in being awarded. And as I briefly alluded to, we have seen that the 
uh, gender diversity, which was already good in the before we introduced the randomization, has been maintained. And that was what the modeling we did beforehand had suggested. But we've also seen that the uh, 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 um, diversity of institution has improved. The diversity of ethnic origin has also, ethnic background, has also improved. Um, so, um, yeah, it, 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 it's interesting because I think one of the other questions I've noticed is, is essentially turning it the other way about, as it were, of the people who don't pass the threshold. And we haven't understandably perhaps I haven't gone and looked explicitly so far at the people who don't pass the threshold and whether there are common characteristics among them it's an interesting point that you know will be worth investigating further um, with the consultants we're working on on that uh, but that's what they're especially looking at in this uh, immediate evaluation stage which is the the the, the characteristics of the pool as a whole as it were um, because obviously the outcomes from the awards, because they, I didn't mention that there are two year awards, that the, the, the outcomes at the end are, are, are going to take a little bit longer to see. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So there's one, uh, another one that received um, four likes, so to say. So how much extra administration and time does it take to perform the partial randomization, for example, for the funder and for reviewers? Uh, it, it's actually exactly the opposite. There's a lot less administration and a lot less time. Um, in the past, once we got uh, all of the initial assessment, then the final decisions took quite uh, you know, a, a month or so to be able to, to sort out, get you know, confirmation of rank orders, panel meetings, all the rest of it to take place. All of that's been done away with. Um, and the uh, randomization itself, which is done completely independently from us by consultants who are employed to, to work on it, um, uh, it literally takes about, you know, half an hour, and you know, whatever they, we, we send off the anonymized you know, references of these are the people who've passed the threshold and they send us the results the next day, basically. Um, it's, it's a very, very swift process that removes a lot of administration. Um, the other advantage is it also gives us a completely ranked ordered list um, from beginning to end, as it were, and we can draw the threshold that to be funded um, at the appropriate place, depending on the amount of money we have available. So we will always have reserves. As I say, there are always far more people who are suitable for funding than we have uh, uh, the money to be able to support. But if we do then get more money that enables us to offer more awards, we know exactly who to go to next um, because it's a completely rank ordered list. Thank you. Okay, um, I've got... Uh... Two questions um, for Lisa, and then um, a few more for Ken as well. Um, so first one, Lisa, you said that you don't think that anonymization is the solution in all cases. What could be the problems of anonymization? Thank you. It's a, it's a good question. I think um, it, it actually loops a, a little bit to, um, the efforts involved in anonymization. So it certainly shifts the way applicants apply. Um, so the way that it was done in these four organizations is not a resource neutral effort. Um, and the organizations took great care. Um, they did provide evaluators with some instructions about how to approach anonymization, like don't go and hunt down information on who the applicants are. So you kind of have to trust that your evaluators aren't doing that. Um, and I'm sure this might come up again later in, in today's seminar. Um, but I also think there, there are cases where, um, so in Australia, in, in our other funding systems as elsewhere, there are um, schemes that run more like fellowships than project-based allocations. And obviously you can't anonymize if you are awarding a fellowship to someone for what they've done to date. Um, so I think anonymization can be one piece of the puzzle to try and promote equity in a in a funding or resource allocation ecosystem, but it it has its challenges. And I will, as I mentioned, also Australia is pretty small. Um, so 
I, I know most personally know most of the people um, when I'm asked to review grants, I already know who they are. And if they stripped out the name, I would probably still know who they are because we're a small enough country where the area of research that we're evaluating grants is, is identifiable. So you have to be a little bit careful by maybe believing that stripping names achieves anonymization. I think that's a real functional question to ask um, whether that's feasible and people can can be um, not necessarily trying to find out who who's writing an application, but they simply know. And then it's even harder. I'm a social psychologist. So, you know, once you have information in head, it's really in mind, it's really hard to ignore it. Thank you, Lisa. I think from um, our review for the evidence review, that was also the main argument against implementing this systematically as people within the sector tend mm. to know each other. Um, there's um, one more question here. So uh, question for Lisa, interesting data. Anonymization would also be removing contextual background of an applicant, for example, early career, who would have a less prolific track record, uh, et cetera. Has your research looked into this as well? That's an interesting question. Um, so, if you're if you're stripping, I guess it depends on how you do it. So these um, organizations stripped identities, not necessarily track records, but there is a different approach to um, kind of two stage grant review where a project is evaluated first before any information about the researchers is made available to evaluators. I'm personally more a fan of that approach because I feel like you can get a fairly identity free evaluation of the idea that's being presented and then can layer in evaluation of maybe um, feasibility or uh, if you will, track record as evidence of being able to carry out that specific project. Um, I think that there are cases where some researchers would say, I certainly want my prolific track record to be taken into account. Like I actually don't wanna be anonymized. I've worked really hard over the five years and I don't want that stripped of me. And I, I think that there are cases in which that's a valid approach. Um, if, if the allocation is dependent on some sort of feasibility or achievement evaluation. But if you go to the British Academy model of randomization, then that doesn't really have any bearing whatsoever. Um, so it's probably a middle ground for me. It's a middle ground and a, probably a combination of methods that is the best approach depending, depending on the type of allocation you're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you for a comprehensive answer, Lisa. Um, we've got time for, I think, two more questions uh, for Ken. So again, I'll go for the ones that have been voted up um, um, the most. So there's one here asking, how were candidates made aware of the British Academy partial randomization? How do we know that the applicants were influenced by the new policy? Yeah, no, that's a, a good point. We've done a lot of uh, work on our communications uh, about this with our communications directorate and colleagues, uh, both through social media, through the uh, email bulletins that we send out. Uh, the British Academy, also my members of my team also go, we go regularly to uh, universities to raise awareness about the uh, Academy's funding as a whole. Um, and we tend to go to places that you know, might not necessarily think of uh, where we get the largest numbers of applications we want to make sure that people are aware of. Um, so, yeah, we do a, a, a lot of, of promotion about that. Where, when the number of applications was uh, started increasing the first round of randomization, we wondered if that was partly at least more to do with opening up again of travel and, and fieldwork possibilities after the pandemic, that was certainly something. But the fact that the numbers have continued to increase and uh, the responses we've uh, tended to see suggest that it is people being uh, encouraged to apply who might otherwise have self-disqualified themselves. Um, that it's not the only reason, it wouldn't be the only reason why people have become aware of it, but uh, we definitely think that's been part of it. Thank you. And one last question, because before we move on to the next set of presentations, um, have you received pushback 
uh, Ken. For example, is there any feedback from people who are not successful in the randomization, feeling that the quality of the application was not sufficiently considered? And yeah. if so, how do you respond mm -hmm. and make the case for randomization? No, that's a, it's a it's a good point. Yeah, we we haven't uh, uh, really had significant pushback from people. Many, many people value the fact that they can now get feedback, which we previously weren't able to give. Um, many people we're aware uh, use the fact that if they're told they passed the quality threshold, but were then unsuccessful, that that is in some way a kite mark of endorsement of their project anyway, um, that they're actually able to then say, you know, the idea was great. It just didn't happen to get, and we're talking about very small scale funding in the first place. Um, the other thing, I, I, again, I noticed in one of the other questions in the Q&A that somebody had said about, can they reapply? Yes, people who are unsuccessful, having had the feedback about whichever characteristic it was, that, uh, whichever criterion, I beg your pardon, was not being uh, considered as strong, particularly if it's the methodology, for example, or the time scale of the, the, the uh, the quality of the research or whatever, they're able to address that aspect of it um, more and be able to resubmit um, uh, hopefully a better application a second time. And we are seeing people who are successful subsequently who have been turned down at the randomization stage, as well as people who've improved from having had a no answer to begin with to uh, then getting yes across the board and being above the threshold. And getting the award. So, um, you know, we think it's fairly positive. There are al always going to be the odd one or two people who are, I don't understand why, you know, but um, not given the proportion, the numbers of the 1800 I'm talking about that we're getting, it's it's a tiny proportion uh, and, and they tend to be, you know, uh, not sufficiently upset to, you know, not be persuadable, the fact they can reapply. Thank given you, that, Ken. Given, given that we've got some time pressures and there's a lot of questions, um, if Lisa and Ken, if you would like to go through and sort of type answers, um, we can try and grab some of those questions at the end and sort of keep those, but there's a lot of good discussion there. Yeah, that was exactly what, thank you, Fennan, I wanted to say. Okay, uh, um, our next presenter is uh, Gerard. Um, Fenella, if you could um, share his presentation. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Gerald McGuire, uh, pronouns he, him, and uh, a, a practice manager at Welcome Trust. Um, so delighted to be here today speaking about uh, the current project that I'm working on, which is around inclusive decision-making for our committees. Um, and I'm in a, quite a different stage maybe to other the presentations today, I'm still very much kind of in the throes of like developing this work. So won't be sharing any sort of findings or uh, evaluation of, of the training so far, um, very much kind of sharing our approach and initial thinking. So hopefully just as helpful as well. And it'll be interesting to get your uh, perspectives and thoughts on, on what we've developed so far. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so just a little bit today, uh, I just want to touch briefly on Welcome's context to give you a bit more of that context, um, what our approach is so far to this work and kind of wider committee work happening at Welcome as well um, and how they all sort of link together. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, just uh, to introduce this, you know, Welcome has a, an equity, diversity, inclusion strategy, which is committed to embedding processes that enable it to become a more inclusive funder. And one of those sort of short to medium term objectives that we had within within that strategy was sort of around enabling our uh, funding committees uh, members within that to be able to address EDI challenges um, in their assessment of applications and, and also the meetings in, in, in which these committees happen as well. Um, next slide, please. So what do we actually mean um, by inclusive decision making? Because that's quite a broad term. And actually, I think, depending on what your context is, it could mean many different things, uh, which is something I've, I've sort of learned uh, over this period of time, um, trying to understand what that is for welcome. Where we've landed so far is uh, we believe that inclusive decision making within welcomes context requires both the development of EDI related knowledge, to build that sort of awareness and literacy uh, when assessing applications and discussing applications, but it also requires like an understanding of uh, the experience of, of those that participate in committee meetings and how those may 
behaviors and dynamics actually influence those experiences as well. So there's sort of the training piece, but it's also the dynamics in the room piece as well. Uh, and one's sort of more process and structures and one is sort of training. Uh, next slide, please. So, and, and again, so a bit on, on Welcome's context, um, a lot of how we fund is uh, through either our open mode discovery research schemes. So these are three schemes that happen three times a year. Uh, and also we have more sort of bespoke funding calls, um, our health challenge areas or mental health, infectious disease and climate and health um, strategic programs uh, will have bespoke funding calls to meet priorities within their own strategies. So um, we sort of interact uh, with committees in, in a variety of ways at Welcome as well. So there, there can't be sort of a, a one size fits all approach with this work. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of scope and, and trying to kind of um, think about this, um, we sort of landed on, you know, anyone who plays a role in, in funding decisions um, will be sort of within the scope of this work as the relevance of the content will actually be applicable to all. Um, however, the kind of the variety that I'm speaking to that happens at Welcome with committee members um, kind of leads to maybe a prioritization, there's a sort of a business case to maybe kind of uh, prioritize one group more than others. And, and that would be our uh, committee members within the discovery research panels, because A, we have both shortlisting and interview panels, um, but also there's a much longer term commitment. You know, these people could stay with us for many years. So there's, there's more of a case because they're not employees. So technically we can't really mandate training per se. Um, but there is that longer term commitment. So there's there's a bit more sort of wiggle room in terms of uh, managing and, and setting those expectations um, of, of, of sort of how we have that relationship together. Um, and then um, we also have our research program. So that model is more of a, an ad hoc assembling of committee members um, for those specific funding calls. So they will be bringing particular expertise and knowledge um, for those particular funding calls. So there may be kind of less of a longer term um, relationship of welcome there, which means the expectation and then the level of training we could do with these individuals might be slightly less. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, the approach, uh, and just to kind of give brief timelines, we, there was a discovery phase. Um, we are now kind of bang in the middle of the, the design phase of this work, um, which will involve um, a lot of collaborating and, and workshopping with our colleagues um, within discovery research and research programs, as these are the individuals that actually sit in these spaces and uh, have done in some cases for many years and will have that knowledge and experience that they can bring to the sort of development of, of what this training content could look like. And then hopefully by September, we will have tested, uh, developed, tested, and um, we'll be sort of ready to kind of roll with some training content for committee members. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, the discovery phase um, was very interesting um, for me personally as well. So I got to observe quite a wide, wide range of committee members to get a baseline understanding of, of what the committee meetings and discussions and assessments sort of look like. Um, we also used a survey to gather the perspectives and experience of the committee members themselves regarding the committee meeting processes, what challenges they faced, um, and what they felt their own training needs were, which I think is important um, to understand that rather than kind of maybe assuming what, what people need from a training perspective. Um, we also conducted a series of interviews with welcome colleagues regarding the committee meeting process as well, because they are also very partly uh, involved in in these processes. So again, it's it's worth getting their perspectives. And to kind of add to this, we, we did a, a small set of interviews with other funders and organizations who also use panels in a similar way to welcome to get a, an idea of uh, what interventions or practices they're doing, if they're doing any training as well. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a little quote that we got from one of the uh, survey results. So it's all about elements of EDI training would be helpful, but a focus on task at hand has been informed by observations and, and evidence uh, would be the sort of preference, um, which leads nicely into uh, the next slide, which is sort of around some of the design considerations that we kind of want to bring into this uh, um, thinking. Um, you know, where is bias most likely to feature when assessing and discussing applications? How do we really collate all these real life examples? Um, I think I'm out of time, so I'll speed up. Uh, collate these real life examples to embed that learning to make it really role specific. Um, 
anti-racism, anti-ableism are priority areas for welcome. How do we use the sort of intersection of um, an anti-racist approach, an anti-ableist approach and assessment when designing content? Um, and ultimately, these are very, very busy people. How do we kind of build something that is flexible and, and also safe in, in terms of this content because the content can relate to people's identities as well? So some of the challenges is, is really kind of separating, you know, what what can be solved with training versus what can be solved with tweaks to a process because um, inclusion can can kind of um, straddle both those sides and uh, one I hope to solve with, with the training but um, it's also kind of within within welcomes context to try and um, I guess maybe have a marginal gains approach you know there's, there's nothing we can kind of solve with, with one single solution as, as we're kind of hearing as a theme across today already um, so where are the real small areas that we can actually begin to make a difference? Um, we also have a huge variety of knowledge and experience in our community member cohort. So there's about 400 people. Some their daily practices and research will actually involve anti-racism and anti-ableist work. Uh, and some might be on an, an the other end of the spectrum kind of doing more kind of cell-based research. Not that there's a, a binary in terms of understanding there, but um, you are sort of having to kind of cater for a lot of different knowledge um, and is there something that kind of suit all those people and uh, a key aspect of this that I want to acknowledge is the fact that the applicant's perspective in all this is missing so far um, while building training for a certain group um, I kind of acknowledge that this is probably something at a later point that I'd like to feed into to how we design and iterate the training going forward uh, next slide please so uh, this is just to acknowledge that there's also a bit of EDI guidance, uh, and again, next slide, please. That's some EDI guidance that's being developed at Welcome, which will go along with the training. Uh, our committee members also get an onboarding experience, which kind of outlines roles, responsibilities, expectations, what Welcome values, um, that kind of thing. And next slide, please. And just a little summary. Um, so we're really kind of trying to take a human-centered approach um, where we're striving to deliver something that's role specific based on real scenarios to embed learning, centers the experience of those particularly underrepresented in our funding and kind of creates space and moments for reflection as well because uh, the, the, the reflective space I think is, is highly critical um, going forward to, to really embed that learning. Uh, and next slide, thank you. Thanks very much. Um... Uh, thank you also to Ken and Lisa for continuing to answer questions. And thank you for uh, this presentation, Heroic, because part of the our evidence review was that we tried to find out more about training and training development, and there's very little in the public sphere. So it's great to hear about your approach. And just um, while we get Matthew's slides up, um, will a quick question for me, will you um, somewhere publish uh, your findings or reflections or evaluations on building the training or the effectiveness of the training? Is there a chance for there to be anything like a report or? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's probably a conversation I still need to have with people at Welcome in terms of what gets shared and what doesn't get shared. But uh, ideally for me, I would, I would like us to be able to share the training once it gets developed as well. Um, while it might be bespoke to welcome, uh, the hope is, as you mentioned, you know, there, there isn't a lot out there. So if we can kind of start somewhere uh, and allow others to kind of use some form of a template that they feel works for them would be ideal, really. And I think welcome sort of in a position with its level of resource to be able to kind of do something like that. Great. Thank you very much. And um, over to you, Matthew, on uh, narrative CVs and your evaluations of their effectiveness. Thanks, Stephanie. I hope that I'm audible okay. I know I had connection issues earlier. Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm I'm Matt. I work uh, at Cancer Research UK in our funding policy and governance team. Um, and as the title of the slide in front of you suggests, I'm going to talk to you today about um, applicants and reviewers' perceptions of using the narrative CV for CRUK funding. Next slide, please. So with the short space of time, I am making um, the fatal assumption that many of you are at least familiar with the idea of the narrative CV. Um, obviously, if not, the Q&A is there at the end, but um, just a small bit of background um, about how that sort of evolved at, at Cancer Research UK. Um, up until 2022, so introduced in 2017, we had in our application form a section for three to five key achievements that was for non-fellowship applications. But um, early in 2022, and probably in line with many of the other funders 
others in the sector that were exploring research assessment reform. We replaced that section um, with a structure that resembled the resume for researchers that was um, adopted or introduced by the uh, Royal Society. Um, we adopted three of the four questions that were used, the generation of new knowledge, the contribution to developing others, and also the contribution to the wider research community. Next slide, please. Now, um, when we consider the question, is the narrative CV working, which is one that we are posed regularly, it's probably a little too soon to consider its impact longer term on things like research culture and research quality. But what we can do at this stage is survey those using it to understand actually, does it meet their expectations and is it a credible tool for research assessment? Um, so uh, the um, using a funding call from last year, we surveyed applicants and reviewers using a standard question set adopted by other funders across the sector so that we can collate and compare our data more um, cohesively and also a diversity question set uh, developed by EDIS, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in Science. Next slide, please. So I'm going to run through um, some of the high level findings, but again, you're welcome to um, um, ask any questions you have later on if there's anything that's unclear. So in terms of its value and feasibility, um, about four five applicants were either very satisfied or satisfied it was a credible opportunity to describe their skills and experience which is great it's kind of meeting its primary uh, purpose when introduced um, reviewers were also uh, supportive of that um, but they can see at the bottom there that they were a little bit more split on and actually how easy it is to assess. So about a third each saying it was either easier the same or harder than assessing compared to a traditional CV. Next slide please. Um, in terms of the guidance and support available, um, of course, to us, very reassuring to see that our guidance is at the very least OK and at the very most very clear um, to the vast majority of applicants. But unfortunately, um, nearly half of the applicants who responded didn't have support available to prepare their CV. And it's also important to note that that percentage doesn't include those that actually did not seek out um, support. So there were some that responded saying there wasn't any support available, but they didn't need it. So that 44% represent people that actually might have um, required support to prepare. Next slide, please. We also, um, this, well, the standardized question set also posed uh, questions to applicants reviewers on any concerns they had and whether there were changes they would like to see in the use of the narrative CV. So um, that first point from applicants, interestingly, a very specific demographic um, uh, corresponded saying that there, there was a perceived advantage to extroverts, native English speakers, and neurotypical people, basically down to language proficiency. Um, but I'd really like to pick up on who those people were if, if there's a chance in the Q&A. Um, applicants also asked for um, example CVs, which isn't typically something that funders and institutions using the CV format would like to use. We don't want to suggest uh, um, an ideal academic or what you know an excellent researcher looks like, but what we are keen to do um, is respond to another request, which was for more example evidence and prompts about what kind of skills and experience applicants may wish to include in their narratives. Um, reviewers commented on that it was less clear than a traditional CV. Um, I think this is probably going to be one of the trade-offs that comes with moving to a narrative structure away from um, you know, the classic lists of papers, patents, grants, presentations, et cetera. Um, but if we can um, introduce you know, ways to make it more standardized, maybe a smaller um, form of structuring so that it's easier for them to review. Um, and they were also were uh, keen for um, a bit more clarity about scoring criteria. And this forms very much part of a broader um, review of our research assessment that we're looking at. Next slide, please. We also introduced um, a couple of questions that weren't in the shared question um, set. Um, this was to get a sense of actually how well embedded narrative CVs were really in review. So on the left, the first question we asked was, is the exclusive use of the narrative CV suitable for assessing research outputs? I.e., could we do away with things like a publication list and instead have the narrative CV as the place that that could be covered? So about a third of applicants and reviewers agreed with this, but you can still see there in that gray box that about half still disagree with the idea that we can do away with the publication list. Um, so clearly there's space for um, you know, interrogating why that is. On the right, we asked reviewers only to what extent they base their assessment of applicants' track record um, using either the CV or uh, research outputs. And we we kind of gave a scale of to what extent they used um, entirely narrative CV, entirely research outputs, and scales between that. Um, so broadly speaking, about half are either using the narrative CV more than outputs or equally. But again, you can see that research outputs 
really are quite important um, to um, nearly half of reviewers. Next slide, please. So just to uh, kind of summarize at least what I've discussed up until now, um, so, so far the evidence from the applicants and reviewers is that the narrative CV is a great space to evidence diversity of skills and experience. Reviewers appreciate it, but find it can be easier or harder to use in their assessment. Users at the moment generally disagree with its exclusive use to evidence research outputs. Our guidance is considered to be clear, but we could provide more example evidence um, and we'll look at how our scoring criteria is a bit more um, obvious and clear to reviewers and applicants alike. And finally, as you see at the bottom, probably something that we will want to pick up afterwards is that many applicants didn't have support available to prepare their narrative. So on the next couple of slides, just quickly giving a bit of a slice of how those views uh, vary by demographic. So um, positively, there weren't any striking differences between um, groups based on um, protected characteristics, et cetera. Um, but there are some nuanced findings I wanted just to quickly run through. Um, women users um, of, the, of the CV were actually typically more appreciative of its utility. Um, but as you can see there in magenta, that typically they were less likely to have support available in preparing their CV. In terms of age, users feel more comfortable with um, the format with increasing age. That could come just purely from having a lot more experience of drafting and reviewing narratives of your own. Um, unfortunately, with in terms of health condition, um, our sample size wasn't particularly big, not big enough to really understand whether there are striking differences um, based on whether you face um, small or substantial barriers based on a long-term condition. But at least with those that we had looked at, there might be some issues with the format. Next slide, please. Um, ethnic minorities were slightly less convinced of the value compared to the traditional CV format. So you can see there in Magenta that whilst uh, many more white respondents um, felt it's an improvement, um, a smaller number, um, still over half though, um, feel that uh, it is a, you know, a credible um, improvement on the traditional CV. But actually in contrast to the point um, I made before in terms of um, this perceived advantage to um, English first language speakers, actually none of our non-native English speakers um, had issues, for example, with the guidance we provided an assessment, and actually they were broadly more supportive of its use um, compared to English native speakers. But again, like with women, as I've highlighted, they were less likely to have support. So final slide is just to thank you for listening. Um, and of course, um, if you have any queries that you don't want to pose in the Q&A, my email address is there. And I should also say, I'll pop it in the chat, that um, we published a blog today on this, which you're welcome to read. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was, uh, it was very interesting to hear evaluations of this intervention since it's been quite prominent and we couldn't quite pinpoint where the idea came from and how successful it would be. So that was, I was very curious about this. So thank you very much. Um, because we don't have much time left, I'll hand straight over to Tom. And uh, please continue to put your questions in the chat. I hope we have 15 minutes at the end um, to go through them. Um, and I'll hand over to you, Tom. Uh, thank you so much. I promise to be as brief as I can. I'm really excited to hear everyone's uh, talks before me and to be kind of finishing off the talks. I feel very much like I'm among friends presenting on this topic. Um, I'm, I'm representing the Research on Research Institute uh, today, which has funding from uh, some of the funders uh, that we have seen represented here, welcome ARC included, and is dedicated to kind of uh, understanding the research ecosystem and, and contributing to the improvement of it. Maybe let's have the next slide. Um, there's some details on the slides, but if you want to get them, you can get them via the link here. Um, so I'll go through these quite quickly, and if you miss anything, you'll be able to pick it up. Let me tell you about the um, project I'm uh, leading for the Research and Research Institute, which is called FIRE, the Accelerator for Innovation Research Funding Experimentation. I'm an experimental psychologist. I love designing experiments. Half of the time I study decision-making and particularly group decision-making, and half of the time I devote uh, to research on research. So this is a kind of a lovely combination for me to apply those tools about understanding experiments and evidence generation to understanding uh, research funding. Uh, let's have the next slide. So the um, uh, a FIRE project, uh, which launched uh, last Monday, has five aims. We want to increase awareness of uh, 
evidence on how research funding can be improved, fairer, more efficient, um, and opportunities for experiments. We want to excite people about uh, the opportunities for doing experiments. We want to work with funders to uh, uh, help more experiments be done and better experiments and kind of generate a culture of um, uh, principled investigation of how we can do research on research in the research funding system, how we can use evidence, um, and how we can support each other to find out what works better. Uh, let's have the next slide. So the model for this is as an accelerator. We have a forum which funders can join where they can uh, kind of uh, share experience of experiments that they've done or that they um, might want to do. We have support available from within the Rory team uh, where we can ever offer technical kind of uh, expertise on designing, evaluate, design and evaluation. And we can also kind of broker connections between funders and between funders and academics. And then we want to make and be involved in the actual experiments uh, in the funding system. And I'll, uh, I'll talk about one of them that's happening currently. Let's have the, the next slide. Oh yeah, so there's the, th the three sections, the forum, this is this will be ongoing. We had our, uh, our launch on Monday, we had keynotes talking about uh, UK uh, Meta Science Initiative, the Volkswagen Foundation's uh, uh, work on experiments and the National Science Foundation's uh, uh, in the US uh, Meta Science program. The recordings are available. Uh, so if you wanna catch up on the keynotes, we didn't record any of the discussion because we want to create a kind of safe environment. Uh, but the keynotes are available uh, and we're going to be uh, having a, an ongoing series um, if you uh, represent a funder who wants to is doing experiments or wants to be involved in uh, doing experiments do get in touch next slide please uh, we offer uh, support on uh, running experiments um, we've got uh, this thing called uh, from phase one of Rory excellent Matt thank you uh, we've got the Experimental Research Funders Handbook, which has a lot of discussion of um, uh, what it takes to run an experiment in a funding organisation, and kind of particularly case studies of partial randomization. So great, great to hear Ken talk earlier. Um, and I thought at this stage, if I could have the next slide, please. I'll just quickly say something about what I mean by experiments, because there's there's a um, there's a informal use of the word experiments and there's an austere use. Uh, so the informal use of experiment is what we use in everyday language, which means just trying something out. And then there's the austere use, which you can get from some sort of like uh, 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 in some sectors of uh, em empirical science, which is an experiment is a randomized control trial, the gold standard of experiment generation. And, and I think what we want to support in a fire is something in between um, or, or, or something higher up the ladder. So it is about uh, sometimes trying uh, trying things out, though they may not necessarily be new. Um, it's not just about evaluating, but committing to formal and rigorous evaluation. And what that really means is doing that extra bit of work that means you are generating evidence that translates across time and context. So uh, I think we kind of saw some examples of that in the talks today. It means working on defining what your research question is or your research questions, being explicit about your target measures, what you're going to measure in advance, having an analysis plan, um, committing to reporting the results, regardless of before you know what they are, um, and sort of trying to ascend the ladder of of strong causal inference. So what that means is knowing uh, what didn't just happen at the same time, but what caused what, what did narrative CVs or whatever your intervention it was, uh, generate uh, the change in applicants or did, was that just uh, happened at the same time? Experiments are one way of doing that, but they're really the, the remit for, we mean by experimentation is that broader class of rigorous uh, inferences supported by formal evaluations. Next slide, please. How long have I got? Two minutes, I think. One minute. So uh, really excited to be involved with the Volkswagen Foundation. They're doing an experiment on uh, distributed peer review. Distributed peer review is where the applicants for funding um, uh, review each other's uh, applications in a college. It involves anonymization. Um, it has the potential to really diversify 
the pool of people who are judging funding applications. Uh, it has uh, the opportunity to potentially um, uh, 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 spread or reduce the burden on the funder of reviewing. Uh, we're really excited to, to uh, work with the Volkswagen on this. Uh, what has happened is we went through a, a, a process of planning this um, and the applications have been received and are currently being reviewed. So watch this space. We're really looking forward to reporting back on the next slide. I uh, have a, uh, an exercise we did with the Volkswagen, which I found was quite useful, where we, we work with them to talk about what the different outcomes they would be interested in, who they concerned, what their, the focus, the audience was, and then how we would translate those outcomes into a measure that would tell us whether we got it right or wrong. And then sort of inference wise, what the kind of statement was that we would want to support by measuring that outcome. And that I think was a really useful uh, exercise, which will be kind of a, a flash up there. I'm not gonna talk through. So I'm at my time. I wanna have discussion with uh, everyone on the call. So um, please do get in touch. I'd love to hear about anyone who's doing experiments or wants to do experiments. Um, and uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Tom. And congratulations on uh, launching a fire last week. Was it last week? Yes. And uh, yeah, there's so much relevant work in a fire, even the, um, you know, group uh, decision-making processes that you're interested in for panels is highly relevant uh, for this. And um, also obviously I'm very curious about the outcome of um, the experiment that you just said about uh, distributed um, review panels. So very, very interesting. Um, thank you so much. Um, so these were all of our presentations. We've got 15 minutes left. And obviously because your presentation was last Tom, your questions are just coming in now. <laughs> Um, I'm going to make a start. There's quite a few uh, for Garrett and for um, Matthew. Um, I will, again, start with those that have been um, voted up. Um, and we'll, we'll start with Matthew, if that's okay. Um, so there's one here which says, um, Matthew, I work closely with researchers as a research professional staff. Many applicants to the UKRI schemes I have talked to seem to be unhappy with the guidance given. And it's surprising to see that Cancer Research UK has received a wider acceptance from applicants. Have you discussed this aspect across the sector? Um, yeah, thank you for your question. So um, unfortunately, the joint funders group um, where we would share these kind of uh, findings and learnings hasn't had the opportunity to meet recently. Otherwise, that absolutely would be a great point and to, to share notes and to compare um, the kind of guidance we provide. Um, I guess your, your question is relatively broad in that, you know, UKRI schemes vary across multiple research councils and disciplines. So it could be that um, this is an issue specific to certain disciplines or indeed something wider than that. Um, maybe from the perspective of um, cancer researchers applying to our funding, I guess we have the small advantage of being um, limited in uh, our disciplinary scope or at least the kind of outcome we wish to seek. Um, so maybe there is already a presumption on the part of the applicant what is appropriate evidence for them to provide. Um, they might have general comfort because they're confident that things like publications, clinical practice and commercialization are already very highly prized qualities and outputs and um, activities in the cancer research space. So um, I guess Guidance is one thing. It's great to have something you know, present digitally or um, in an application form, but we forget as well um, that prior orientation that applicants might already have about what is good and not. And that could count against us if we, if applicants, for example, already feel they understand how to fill out a narrative CV. It could be because they are deferring to um, classic conventional outputs, which we want to try and broaden in a more diverse sense. Thank you. I've got another one for you simply because it's also been um, voted up the most. So um, your point on lack of support for applicants writing narrative CVs is really interesting and vital. I'm a research development manager supporting applicants and we're in general where we are in general struggling to understand what good looks like. Are there any plans to share guidance or examples of good practice which we could use in supporting applicants? 
So um, I'm going to post uh, a link in the chat, which is spurred on by, um, I think, Mary Muirs, who's in the audience today. So uh, Oxford have a fantastic um, tranche of, of guidance on their page, including on their website, including um, a webinar so you can at least instill confidence in what the narrative CV means, why it's important. So I'd really turn to that if you um, don't yet have any written content yourself. What good looks like is extremely difficult to answer. And I guess the whole point about the, the format, this narrative CV format was to provide space to corroborate that you are good. And previously we've had um, reviewers reading between the lines, thinking, you know, creating a, um, a mental narrative of you um, by virtue of you know, your publication list, for example. So now you have the opportunity to sell your story um, and paint your career trajectory, which is something that our reviewers in the survey were particularly keen to point out was a real benefit of the, the narrative. So being able to show that transition um, and as you get you know, um, more, um, you get a better background that equips you for carrying out the research that you're proposing. That's the sort of quality you want to convey. I think another um, point I'd like to make is the idea that experience and achievements need to be relevant to the work proposed. So I think weak narratives haven't just been because of perhaps um, somebody's experience, but often that people, um, applicants will will throw a range of things that they think are important, but actually don't have direct relevance to the proposal at hand. Um, and perhaps that's where we've been previously, where publication lists have sort of overwhelmed reviewers and made them feel that this must be a credible applicant when actually some of those publications might be um, outdated and, and have li limited bearing on the research proposed. So yeah, my suggestion would be relevant achievements um, uh, and making sure that um, the uh, the applicant is is aware of, of how it fits to their proposal. Thank you, and thank you for uh, also sharing the resource here, Matthew. Okay, I've got um, two questions for Geroid. So um, the first one is, what do you envisage the training will look like? Would it involve case studies, lived experience of minoritized researchers, for example? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, in many ways, I'm actually trying proactively not to to kind of remain somewhat agnostic to what the training is going to look like to allow others to sort of feed into the design of it. But I, I do imagine that it will be some sort of e-learning. And I do think the level of underrepresentation and uh, how long that's gone on for um, has to guide uh, what we prioritize in in the training design. So I think the lived experience of those who are particularly underrepresented in our funding have to kind of come into, into what the learning is going to be about and, and using sort of real life examples, I think really helps embed that learning. So yes, I, I, I do think I would envisage that type of learning. Thank you. And I've got one more here. Um, did you uncover bias in the discovery award review processes that you particularly wanted to address with the training? Um, for example, generally an important thing to do or specifically driven by what the success rate data shows? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I think coming back to the last point, I think that data we've probably known of for quite some time. So I think there's there's enough evidence there to suggest that we need to sort of prioritize what, what sort of shapes this training. Um, I think the training itself, um, there might be elements, and this is where it kind of goes to, you know, where can we maybe add little tweaks to our processes to help mitigate or reduce bias? Because I think bias is just going to exist uh, anyway, really. Um, and people will come into those spaces with their biases. And I think being able to name that in in of itself is actually very helpful. Um, so where we can kind of reduce things like biases could could kind of be more process related and tweaks we, we make to the process um, rather than the training itself. Um, but I think there's scope for both. It's about sort of working with, with colleagues across Welcome um, in a more systemic way as to kind of really understanding what that looks like. I hope that helps. Thank you. 
Um, I've got uh, one more question here that um, Matthew uh, would like um, to discuss as well. That was for, um, for him. So given the time taken and how many disabled slash neurodivergent people struggle with issues like typing and writing, would it not be more accessible to allow applicants the choice of a narrative or a traditional CV? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I wanted to answer this question because it is a is a very reasonable thing to answer um, uh, to ask rather. And I think one of the hazards I pose of of offering a choice is that you you initially start off therefore with an inequity in how someone evidences their case and their background. So um, I don't think it's it's going to be suitable to have that choice there because it's just going to um, potentially put either group at a disadvantage. What I will say though is that. Um, we have um, recently clarified our support for um, uh, individuals that want to apply to our funding that might have a long-term condition such that we can provide adjustments as they prepare their application. So we don't want applicants to be disadvantaged because they might struggle with, um, as has been highlighted, typing or writing. So um, we, and I think actually um, welcome as well as we discuss this, have um, clarified how we um, will provide adjustments to applicants in that process, such that in some instances, if it's particularly difficult, we can find a way to assign a caseworker that can help write up um, your, your narrative there. But Inherently, there will be a challenge. Obviously, we're working with, with with writing, with written text, and clearly that will manifest across the whole proposal too. So we need to consider accessibility that goes just goes much more beyond the narrative and looks at other aspects too. Thank you. Um, we've got two more questions left, and let's see if we can um, answer these two. And then in the very the very end, we also have one more slide to share. So um, I'll just go with the shorter one first. One last one uh, for Matthew. Any opinions on how the disparity between support available, for example, for women writing narrative CVs can be overcome? I fear that more diverse uh, higher education institutions are often smaller and or non-research intensive and so don't have the same resources of support. Um, again, a great question, and I highlighted a lot that there, you know, one of the, the bigger inequities seems to be around that support and preparing, um, which, you know, whilst as a funder, we're not there at the point to which the application is being prepared. We know we still have a responsibility to facilitate that wherever possible. From the institutional point of view, uh, I would encourage a, a positive action approach um, such that where you have marginalized groups that are particularly lacking in support, that you focus your attention and resources on training and upskilling them. So we highlighted that um, basically marginalized populations through our survey were that the particular inequity was at the point of preparing a narrative. Um, so I would encourage that focus there. So if you have a limited number of hours, um, then to focus that on those groups. We do the same for our um, observing scheme where ECRs can observe funding panels and committees. We prioritize those from um, marginalized groups so that they have the, the, the first opportunity to watch those committee um, because they you know, have those gaps in access and opportunity elsewhere in academia. Thank you. Okay, and um, uh, one last one here. Um, it feels to me that what all these presentations are unearthing is that how academics perceive and hence conduct assessment, for example, the metrics of what constitutes an impressive researcher, often narrowly defined down to published academic outputs, is itself propelling the need for all your work. I wonder, therefore, if recommending and designing EDI approaches to equitable assessment could be embedded much earlier on in the researcher career journey, for example, from PGR or ECR level. Reliance on peer assessment essentially runs our research ecosystem, peer review of publications, of funding applications, of recruitment committees, interview panels, of ref committees, etc. And it feels like something the British Academy's ECR network could solicit opinion about. I guess it's all for all of us, but specifically Ken. Yeah, it's a it's a really good point. I've actually copied that question out and we'll go back and speak to my colleagues who lead on the ECR network to make sure. But I, I am aware that they do run lots of uh, uh, um, training sessions, information sessions, webinars and so on. So it's definitely a very relevant point to, to raise and I will we'll follow up on it. 
I, I think others have said during this presentation that kind of biases are inherent to the human mind, and Tom would be very <laughs> familiar with this as a cognitive psychologist um, and as a social psychologist. I would add the lens like erasing biased assessment is is probably not the ideal to seek here. Um, but rather removing the structural barriers that we know that are in place that prevent access to equitable outcomes is is the ideal. Um, and the more that we we understand that the traditional ways that we assess things are often governed by historical systems that benefit certain groups of people, the better we'll do. Um, you know, we we know there are biases in access to publications <laughs> and getting published and author orders and citation metrics. So the more that we can move away from those um, to introduce other ways of assessment, the closer we will become to removing those barriers. Um, but we are, at the end of the day, all human. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. I could not have made a nicer or more appropriate clothing statement. Um, so uh, thank you very much for that. I don't really have much to add to this. So thank you so much to our panel um, for your really insightful presentations and for your really rich answers to um, the questions of our participants. Uh, people are leaving quite promptly now because we are at the end of, the, um, of our time. There's just one more um, announcement, Fenella, um, if you want to. Come yes, in. it's just that the next seminar on the 25th of June from 3 until 4.30 in British time is going to be about deaf researchers' experience of working in the UK. So we have two PhD students, two academics, and it's chaired by Edica's deputy um, PI, that's Professor Jemina Napier. It will be in BSL, interpreted for the hearing audience. So it's going to be an interesting experience for the, the usual experience to be reversed. So I hope that you guys will be able to attend. And as usual, we hope to record it if all the technology supports us. Thanks everybody for coming. And we will share obviously the recording, but also contact information of the speakers and um, projects that have been uh, mentioned and reports that have been mentioned. So we have access to these because we saw in the chat that not everybody has access to them at the moment. So thank you very much, everyone. Bye.